Arcane capacitors are looking nominal, sir. Ready to engage on your mark. The technician cast a glance towards the main control panel where Merrick's decanus stood calmly with his hands behind his back, his gaze scrutinizing the war-forged body that had just been loaded into the creation forge. Very good. Engage when ready. Activating in three, two, one. The technician pulled his dark tinted goggles down and twists the dial on the panel in front of him. Soul infusion successful, sir. It's alive. Open the chamber. All the sentience markers are there, sir. It should take commands. Good. Step forwards. The dimly lit chamber of the Creation Forge began to glow with eerie blue light as a pair of warforged eyes began to pierce through the darkness. Your name is Unit PA002. Your purpose is heavy labor and hazardous waste disposal. The large warforge stood in silence, its eyes remaining fixed on Merrick's. Repeat back to me, what is your name? My name is Unit PA002. And what is your purpose? My purpose? is heavy labor and hazardous waste disposal. A bit of hesitation there, sir. Hmm. Send it up to R&D. They need some help with waste disposal. I must be off. I have a meeting with some of the investors. Uh, if it hesitates again, dispose of it. It is as though the world dare not draw breath for fear that delicate balance should shift and fall. And a new day of mourning be upon us. Hello adventurers and welcome to the next installment of Eberron Historian. Today we will be covering the Masters of Artifice and Innovation, House Caneth, and the Mark of Making. Please remember to hit those like and subscribe buttons below if you're enjoying our content, and switch on notifications to stay up to date as we release new episodes in the future. Let's get started. The heirs of House Caneth bear the mark of making, which manifests exclusively on some of the humans of the continent of Corvair. The mark imbues the wearer with great ingenuity and skill in almost any technical craft, whether it be smithing, alchemy, artifice, tailoring, or pretty much anything involving the act of creation, whether that be by physical or arcane means. The house emblem and coat of arms depicts a gorgon, a monstrous creature resembling a bull, most often pictured projecting a cloud of smoke from its mouth or nostrils. As you might already know, House Caneth are responsible for the vast majority of the Eberron setting's greatest inventions and innovations, such as vehicles and Eberron's unique race, the Warforged. Their inventions are one of the driving forces of Eberron's wide magic aspect, meaning that the use of low-level magic is commonplace throughout the world thanks to the convenient everyday inventions that they produce, such as the everbright lanterns that light the streets of Corvair's cities. They are also responsible for the creation of some of the most devastating and horrible weapons that were brought to bear in the last war, with the house making great profits as they sold arms to all sides. But before all this, they had simple beginnings as traveling salesmen. Let's go back to where it all started. It was around 1,500 years before the Kingdom of Galifar that the Mark of Making began manifesting on the humans of Corvair. The first heirs of Caneth appeared in and around the city-state of Metril, the area that would one day become the Nation of Sire. These heirs had humble beginnings. Those who manifested the Mark tended to become traveling tinkerers. The heirs became renowned as great artisans, craftsmen, and repairmen whose skills were greatly augmented by their marks. They were able to find great fortune, as their skill would far outstrip others in their professions. A few generations passed, and many of those travelers that had been blessed by the mark gathered together, eventually forming the Kanath clan. The clan's renown continued to grow over the next thousand years, and eventually they incorporated and officially formed House Kanath. During this time, most of the other dragon-marked houses also emerged, and sometime around minus 500 YK, House Caneth led the formation of the organization known as the Twelve. During this time, the number of aberrant dragon-marks across Corvair were rapidly growing, 
and with this came a rise in incidents resulting from bearers of those aberrant dragon marks losing control of their powers. This led to a growing distrust of all dragon marked individuals among the general public, and the dragon marked houses needed to act before the public turned against them completely. Thus, the War of the Mark began, as the dragon marked houses united and began a continent wide extermination of all those throughout Corvair who were unlucky enough to have manifested an aberrant mark. House Caneth were one of the main instigators of this conflict, using it as a public demonstration of their power, as well as their latest weapons. It was during this conflict that House Caneth discovered the existence of the Mark of Detection and forced those with the Mark to publicly reveal themselves and form House Madani. Half a century later, as Galifar Wanan achieved his goal of a united five nations, the city-state of Metril became the province of Sire, and the city of Whitehearth became the main seat of power for House Caneth. For 900 years, House Caneth's ingenuity propelled both themselves and the province of Sire to great prosperity. Some of House Caneth's most notable achievements during this time included the House Civis message stations, the first of which were created in 789YK. These message stations dramatically improved the speed and convenience of long distance communication around the populated areas of the continent. In 811YK, House Caneth collaborated with House Orion and the Gnomes of Salago to create the first lightning rail, and another collaboration with the Gnomes and House Lirindar led to the creation of the first elemental galleons. For more information on the many vehicles of Eberron and how they work, please check out my Vehicles of Eberron video, links on screen and below. As wealthy as House Caneth had become, it all paled in comparison to the fortune that the house would make during the last war. When the conflict began in the year 894YK, House Caneth was quick to capitalize on the situation, perfectly happy to abide by the Korth Edicts, which stipulated that all dragon marked houses must stay neutral. House Caneth proceeded to sell its growing catalog of terrible weapons to all sides of the conflict. Although, some favor was secretly shown to the nation of Sire, as it was the seat of the house's power. Sire would commonly be the first to bring the house's latest inventions to bear against their enemies. As the war raged on and the body count grew, House Caneth's coffers continued to grow, and their research would produce some of the most terrible weapons ever seen. Of everything they created and sold, their most profitable and arguably their greatest achievement to date was the creation of the Warforged in the year 965YK. Sentient humanoid constructs built for combat, inexhaustible and totally obedient. They were mass produced and sold in droves to all five nations. For more information on the Warforged and how House Caneth created them, please check out my in-depth video on the Warforged, links on screen and below. In 990YK, in another collaboration with House Lirandar and the Gnomes of Zalago, the first elemental airships took to the skies, a game changer for House Lirandar that would see their rise to the top of the transport industry. Later on in the conflict, the creation and deployment of the enormous Warforge Colossi under the banner of Sire was considered to be the beginning of the end of the war, with a crushing victory surely within their reach, were it not for the cataclysmic events that were about to transpire. On the day of mourning, when Sire was engulfed by an arcane calamity of unknown origin, the majority of the Siren population was killed, including the patriarch of House Caneth, Baron Staran de Caneth. His son and heir Noran de Caneth, as well as many of the other House Caneth leaders and heirs, also perished during the disaster. The city of Whitehearth was lost, and with it, the Forge Hold, which had been the center of House Caneth ingenuity for hundreds of years. This was an enormous blow to the house, only partially offset by the fact that some research programs were also being carried out in the Shan Caneth Enclave, which had survived. Two years later, as the house was attempting to pick itself back up, the blows kept coming as the Treaty of Thronehold was enacted, bringing an end to the war. This not only put an end to Caneth's most profitable source of income, but the treaty also stipulated that they were no longer allowed to produce any new Warforged. Any creation forges that survived the morning were dismantled, with the exception of one, but more on that later. The loss of the Baron, his direct heirs, and most of the house's central leadership caused a dispute between the remaining leaders as to who would become the new house Baron. Three new candidates with varying claims to the position arose, 
Although so far, no one has gained full leadership of the House, with the remaining House seneschals deadlocked in their votes for the prospective leaders. This has led the House to fracture into three separate territories, Kanath South, Kanath West, and Kanath East. Kanath South is operated out of the Brelish city of Shan by Baron Merricks de Kanath, the grandson of the inventor by the same name, and the son of Aaron de Kanath, the two inventors responsible for creating the Warforged. Merricks leads Kanath South with great vision, and many consider his enclave to be the closest replacement for Whitehearth. Out of his workshop, he continues many projects that were concurrent with Whitehearth, as well as funding attempts to recover lost research and technology from Whitehearth itself. He has an expansionist agenda with enclaves throughout Breland, Zalago, and even Dargoon, and is planning the establishment of an enclave in the city of Stormreach in the faraway continent of Gendrick, where he believes he will be free to set up a new creation forge and resume publicly producing Warforged outside of the jurisdiction of the Treaty of Thronehold. I say publicly, because he is currently secretly harboring the last remaining creation forge deep within his Shan workshop, where he continues to produce new Warforged who serve the workshop, unaware of their rights bestowed by the Thronehold Treaty. Merix is the grand nephew of the former patriarch, giving him a good claim to leadership of the house. Relatively young age and inexperience are seen as the deciding factors of his inability to win the position so far. Kanath West is led by Baron Jorlana de Kanath, a one-time house exile who fled to the nation of Ander in her youth after being publicly shamed for a forbidden romance with an heir of House Deneath. Interhouse romances have been outlawed since the War of the Mark, as it is the coupling of individuals with different dragon marks that is known to commonly produce people with aberrant dragon marks. Rumor has it that she gave birth to a child during her year of exile, although this has never been confirmed. This past indiscretion has left an unfortunate mark on her reputation, for she leads Kanath West with great effectiveness and strives for a dream of a united House Kanath once again. She is in her fifties, a more suitable age to be a Baron than Merix, and has a stronger claim as the daughter of Starin's second wife, but her scandalous past has left her deemed untrustworthy by much of the House leadership. Under her leadership, the members of Kanath West conduct themselves with great social aptitude. She works towards rebuilding public opinion of House Kanath and investing in the Twelve in order to strengthen inter-house relations. Much of Kanath West's research involves archaeological expeditions to sites throughout the Eldine Reaches, a feat that Jorlana skillfully negotiated with the nation's druid leaders. In Jorlana's personal life, she has been pursuing a secret relationship with a scion of House Orion, another tryst that would be considered greatly scandalous should the public find out. The situation is worse than she knows. Her secret lover is actually a Rakshasa in disguise, who is manipulating her to guide the house to the whims of the Lords of Dust. When House Kanath sent Karnath its first batch of Warforged soldiers during the war, an emissary named Zorlin de Kanath traveled with them. He ended up taking residence there as an advisor to Karnath's leader, King Caius II, and over the years that followed, he strengthened House Kanath's position within the nation. He forged profitable alliances with the Maror Holds and Lazar Principalities, and ended up becoming an advisor to Baron Starin de Kanath himself. Up until the Day of Mourning, many House Kanath heirs would be sent to Korth, the capital of Karnath, to receive training in diplomacy and administration, as well as martial training at the Reckonmark Academy. Following the Mourning and the Treaty of Thronehold, Zorlin has taken up position as Baron of Kanath East, now an enclave that has immersed itself in Karnathi culture. Members of Kanath East have become callous in their morals, with many of their number embracing the Blood of Vol religion, and have begun experimenting with the undead, working toward an undead construct hybrid to upgrade or replace the undead legions that once served Karnath during the last war. Zorlin himself is a devout acolyte of the Blood of Vol, even leading services himself for the cult's clergy and house members. Of course, none of this is public information. Thank you for watching everybody. If you enjoyed this installment of Eberron Historian, please hit those like and subscribe buttons below and turn on notifications so you're informed when a new episode comes out. Some exciting news, Keith Baker has recently released a new book, Chronicles of Eberron, 
and we'll be covering some of the lore from this book very soon. If you would like to check out the book in the meantime, you can find our affiliate link to DM's Guild below, where you can purchase a copy of the book and Keith Baker's other DM's Guild release, Exploring Eberron. If you like free battle maps or the music I use throughout this video, please swing by my Patreon. For the price of a coffee, you can pick up a monthly pack, including D&D soundtrack I compose myself and a battle map to accompany it. As always, thank you to the loyal patrons who are keeping the channel lights on, and I'll see you next time.